He was born in 1685 to a father who was the barber surgeon in the service of a minor German duke. The child wanted to be a musician and in fact was auspiciously talented. The father wanted him to study law and in fact forbade the child to practice his beloved music. But music eventually won out as it often does and the young man took position after position in some of the most important musical centers in Europe. Dusseldorf, Hamburg, Florence, Italy, and finally in Hanover. In fact, it was at the Hanoverian court of the elector, who was the future King George II of England, which eventually brought the young composer to London in 1710, and there he took up permanent residence. We know him as the composer of oratorios and concert work, particularly Messiah, a work that adorns the musical offerings at Christmas time of churches and concert halls all over the world. But in his own time, he was known as a brilliant harpsichordist and a very popular composer of Italian opera. The man, of course, is Georg Friedrich Handel. And we're here today to discuss one of his most stunning achievements, the Italian opera Adio Dante. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. The story of Handel's rise to musical prominence in the early 18th century is a complicated one. Like Mozart, Handel traveled widely and established relationships with all of the important noblemen, impresarios, singers, and capellmeisters of the day. But what's important to understand is that he arrived in London at a time when royal and aristocratic patrons were clamoring for Italian opera, a form within which he had already proven himself with works like Rodrigo, Agrippina, and Almira. In 1711, during his first trip to London, Handel produced the first Italian opera to be written specifically for an English theater, the Queen's Theater in Haymarket. The opera was Rinaldo, and with its special effects and brilliant scenes, it made a big splash at the Queen's that season. Though based in Hanover, where he was the Kapellmeister to the Elector, Handel continued to travel in and out of London, producing operas there until 1717, when he accepted a post offered him by the Duke of Chandos. From that time onwards, his home was in England, and it was not a coincidence that his prospects continued to improve after the accession of George II in 1727. But it was in 1719 that Handel's opera career really took off, when a small group of nobles established the Royal Academy of Music, specifically for the production of Italian operas in London. The founders of this company were men who had experienced opera in Italy and who had fallen in love not only with the art form, but with some of the great singers who were the superstars of their day, singers like the Castrati, Zenesino, and Farinelli, and the sopranos Faustina Bordoni and Francesca Cuzzoni, who were both very good friends of the composer. Once the Royal Academy was established, it was up to Handel as its music director to travel to Italy and entice some of these singers to return with him to help sell tickets for the fledgling company. In the late 1720s, after an appointment to the court of George II as composer for the Chapel Royal, Handel's career in opera eased off a bit. But a further development occurred in 1733, which spurred on even more operatic activity. Another group of royals, displeased with the Academy and probably miffed by Handel's continued commercial success, established another opera company, the so-called Opera of the Nobility. They hired Handel's singers, including Senesino, out from under his nose and began producing operas by Nicola Porpora and other rival composers. Now, one would think that this would have deterred Handel from re-entering the operatic fray, but he must have been the kind of person who loved a challenge. He assembled a new company, which eventually moved from the King's Theatre Haymarket to the new theatre at Covent Garden. There, in 1735, he produced two of his greatest operas, 
Alcina, and Ariodante. Handel needed a success during these seasons, for the rival opera of the nobility had engaged the greatest singer alive, the castrato Farinelli. But the spectacular success of Alcina and Ariodante and the added brilliance of the Covent Garden resident ballet of Mademoiselle Marie Salé brought victory to Handel over his critics. Alas, after the season of 1735, that kind of operatic success for Handel was rare. After 1740, he turned to oratorios and concert work until the end of his life, often conducting these works from the keyboard himself and writing Messiah in 1742. The source for Ariodante is the epic poem by Ludovico Ariosto, Orlando Furioso, or Orlando Enraged, written between 1505 and 1532. It's often considered the most important literary work to come out of the Italian Renaissance. Ariosto was a reluctant courtier in the service of the Este family, one of those families like the Medicis that had many influential members like dukes and cardinals. In his capacity as a courtier, he had to travel with the family on many perilous journeys throughout Europe in their endless struggle for power over popes and city-states. But above all, Ariosto wanted to be a poet, and so he spent most of his life on this epic poem, dealing with the legend of Charlemagne and his most stalwart knight, Roland, or in the Italian, Orlando. Orlando Furioso deals with Orlando's desperate love for the Indian princess Angelica. This love is unrequited and because of that he goes mad or furioso. The poem also deals with various secondary love stories like for instance the story of Ruggiero and Bradamante. Ruggiero is known in English as Roger and Bradamante unusually is a female knight it is the union between Ruggiero and Bradamante that, according to Italian folklore, eventually became the source of the Este family and the reason that Ariosto wrote this poem in the first place. All of it is set in the context of Charlemagne's struggle with the Saracens, or Moors, in and around the city of Paris. Now, Ariodante is based on a certain section of Orlando Furioso, the fifth canto or section of the poem. There's another great work of art, a literary piece, which is also based on the same material, William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, a play that Handel probably knew. Now, one might think that it was a tragedy that Handel and his opera company lost their lease on the Haymarket Theater in the early 1730s to conflict with the opera of the nobility, but it ended up being a godsend for Handel. He had to use the new theater at Covent Garden. Now this theater boasted all of the latest theatrical technology, and that, coupled with the fact that they had their own resident chorus and resident ballet company, meant that Ariodante and its world of Carolingian knights, ladies in distress, wizards and dragons, could all be recreated with its requisite spectacle. Ariodante indeed had an auspicious beginning with 12 performances which delighted audiences. And it starred in the title role one of the most important singers of the time, the castrato Carestini. Ariodante, a brave and honorable knight, and Ginevra, daughter of the King of Scotland, are in love and betrothed to be married. Polinesso, the Duke of Albany, has his eye on Ginevra for political reasons, but much to his dismay, she has turned him down. He determines to ruin them both. 
Ginevra's servant, Dalinda, is in love with the evil Polinesso and becomes an unwitting partner in his plans. Persuading her to impersonate the princess, Polinesso tells Ariodante that he is regularly received in the princess's bedchamber. As proof, Ariodante watches Polinesso as he is received into Ginevra's rooms by the disguised Dalinda. Ariodante, in turn, runs off to commit suicide. The king is informed that the great knight has drowned himself, and Ariodante's brother, Lurcanio, publicly denounces Ginevra for her infidelity. She's immediately disowned by her father, the king, and imprisoned. In the meantime, we discover that Ariodante was saved from suicide and is now wandering through the forest in disguise. Ariodante rescues the handmaiden Dalinda from assassins sent by the evil Polinesso. She reveals Polinesso's plot to Ariodante, and he rushes back to Scotland to save his beloved Ginevra. Ariodante's brother, Lurcanio, has sworn to fight in order to prove the princess's infidelity, and Polinesso offers himself to her as her protector. She refuses. But the king insists, and the battle ensues, with Polinesso mortally wounded and Lurcanio the victor. As there is no other champion in the offing, the king relents and offers to enter battle with Lurcanio himself when Ariodante and Dalinda appear and reveal the whole evil plot. As Ginevra, in prison, prepares for death, the king and his entire court enter and announce her innocence. Ariodante and his princess are reunited. The Baroque style in opera might be something relatively new to you, so I thought that I'd take a little time and spend it with my good friend Dr. Bob Thompson, who's the director of music here at All Souls Episcopal Church in Point Loma. Bob has spent an awful lot of time in his academic and performance career as a kind of specialist in Baroque style music. So, Bob, welcome to Opera Talk. Thank you, Nick. Good nice to, to be here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, before we start, tell me something about this gorgeous instrument that's here in your church. This instrument is built exactly along the lines of the Baroque period. It's completely mechanical, has low wind pressure, a special kind of tuning, and it has exactly the sounds that Bach and Handel had on the instruments that they had to play so on. What they were used to hearing. What this they were is used to hearing. This is exactly this what. This is exactly what the Baroque that, instruments sound like. That's spectacular. That today we can actually recreate those colors and those specific sounds. I think most of us are used to the AM, FM, radio type of organ, the electronic <laughs> instruments, right. but this is the real thing. Real thing. Tell us then a little bit about uh, Baroque style elements. Some of the basic elements of Baroque style, I think first of all, the thing, thing that comes to mind is what's referred to as soprano bass polarity. Uh, whether the top part is an oboe and the bottom part is a cello, there's this basic texture running through a lot of Baroque music called soprano bass polarity with just filled in harmonies in between. So mm -hmm. it's really, it really was a very simple idea. Mm -hmm. And then it gave rise and possibility to the idea of the recitative, which is then in opera you need that declamatory, free-flowing, almost speech-type style with a very simple accompaniment. So that made recitative po uh, possible in right. opera. Another thing is the um, omnipresent Basso continuo. Oh, yes. It is basso continuo. a bass sustained line, either cello, bassoon, or gamba, and then something to fill in the harmony. Uh, harpsichord or organ, usually, but sometimes lute. So, this basso continuo is always, almost always present in Baroque uh, chamber music mm -hmm. and um, especially in opera. And in church music, then, the continuo instrument would have been an organ such as this, and in secular music or in opera, the instrument probably was... Was harpsichord. The harpsichord, or exactly. Lute, but. Now, what about Handel? Tell us something about the style characteristics of Handel. How he, as a 
keyboard player would have used the organ or the harpsichord in the performance of his own works? Well, it was a matter of the conductor, which was also often the composer, conducting from the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So the keyboard sustained uh, throughout the performance. And a lot of this was improvised. The basso continuo did not have the keyboard part written out. There was a system of musical shorthand written below the bass line, which indicated which harmonies to play. So he would simply accompany throughout the entire opera, but a lot of it was improvised. And then within those chords, within the, the structure that was outlined by the numbers underneath the music, uh, the keyboard player, like Handel or Bach, were free... Free to improvise, elaborate, use the, the way the harmonies realized to help express the text or whatever is going on. And this was true of Bach's cantatas. It's, mm -hmm as well as the secular music of Handel. Now, what I find interesting is that Handel would uh, produce almost intermission features in his operas because there was an organ in the interior of Covent Garden Theater where many of his works from Adio Dante on were performed, and he would actually play an organ concerto with the orchestra, would he not? Right, and that's true also of the oratorios where he had organ as continuo. He would entertain during the intermissions, and in fact, there were posters, what the English call notices, mm -hmm. put up when the Messiah and some of the other oratorios were to be performed. It would say, Messiah with organ concerto, as part of their publicity. So it was a, it was a big thing. It would, it would make for a rather lengthy <laughs> evening, <laughs> wouldn't well, it? Very it's lengthy. a little much. I mean, I, I really can't imagine interpolating a whole concerto for organ and orchestra during our intermissions, it, I mean, we'd have a, a five-hour evening. And again, a lot of it was improvised. So a modern edition of a Handel concerto, it, the, the editor really has to kind of guess at some of the right. places where yes. improvisation was a big part of the Baroque period. It's the very last period in music history where uh, performers were expected to embellish and improvise on the given music. The only real 20th century, 21st century counterpart <laughs> to that is jazz. Jazz, is right. It? Where right. instrumentalists are, are really trained to work on their feet, right. to improvise. It, it must have made uh, the performance of these operas and oratorios tremendously exciting for the public. There is, I think, a wonderful vitality about Baroque music that, that, that appeals to us today. Mm -hmm. Uh, in certain ways. And it's not only rhythmic vitality, it's that sense of spontaneity and joy and uh, a lot of contrast. When you think of the entire uh, opera of Handel, Aridante, when you look at the structure, the whole thing is a series of arias and recitatives. So this contrast of free and strict, or like a prelude and fugue, or fantasy and fugue, this kind of polarity was essential feature of the Baroque, and part of its charm, because it had extremes set next to each other. It's wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. It, it really is. is. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. seen the Baroque organ, and we've talked about some Baroque style characteristics. Now let's take a look at the instrument that is ubiquitous in the performance of Baroque music, the harpsichord. Although there are descriptions of such instruments dating from about the mid-14th century, we know the harpsichord was most active from the mid-15th century to the early 19th century, and it came in all shapes, sizes, and designs. But it was distinguished from other keyboard instruments by the fact that the strings are plucked rather than hammered like in the forte piano or gently struck uh, as in the clavichord or the virginal. Now this instrument is a modest example of a one manual or one keyboard harpsichord with two sets of strings layered on top of each other. One set of strings plays at pitch and the second set of strings plays that pitch an octave higher. Now, these strings, these sets of strings are activated by pedals at my feet, but sometimes you'll see harpsichords that have levers on either side of the keyboard that activate those strings. Now, when both sets of strings are being played, 
you get a more brilliant and thicker sound than if you're only using one set. So let me give you an example. Here's a chord playing one set of strings. Now I'll activate the second set of strings and you get a thicker, more brilliant sound. One set, the second set. One of the things that separates the piano and the harpsichord is that on the piano, you can get a gradation of dynamics, in other words, louds and softs, simply by using more or less strength in your hands and in your arms. The harpsichord's dynamic possibilities are limited by virtue of the fact of the way the instrument is built. No matter how hard you strike a key, that key is not going to play any louder. No matter how gently you strike the key, it's not going to play any softer. The string can only be plucked in one way. And the best way to play the harpsichord, and this is the reason that it's so difficult for many pianists, is to play it entirely with your fingers. You cannot use any arm or finger weight at all. Now, since the harpsichord existed from about the mid-15th century, it was already a mature instrument by the beginning of the 17th century when opera was invented. Because opera's inventors were looking for a way to highlight drama and emotion in the text, instruments like, oh, the guitar, the lute, the clavichord, the chamber organ, even the harp, and the harpsichord were thought ideal for the accompaniment of the voice. Why? Well, listen to what happens after I strike this key. The sound of the note decays very, very quickly compared to the piano when I strike a key, leave my finger on it, and the decay is much, much longer. Now, there are lots of physical reasons for this, but the important and most aesthetic thing is that the harpsichord makes it very easy for the singing voice to be accompanied, supported, clearly heard, all at the same time. <laughs> no problem there. There is no way that the harpsichord, even when engaging all of its possible sets of strings, could ever cover or compete with sung text. Every note, and more importantly, every word would be heard clearly and understood. You'll notice the harpsichord was very, very important within the texture of all of Handel's operas. In fact, the composer himself probably sat at the harpsichord, one very much like this, to conduct the orchestra and to accompany the recitatives himself. The great thing about Handel's work at the keyboard was that like other Baroque composers, he didn't write down every single note that the harpsichordist was expected to play. He used a kind of shorthand which gave you a chord symbol and the bass line, and then it was left up to the harpsichordist's imagination to decide how to fill out all of those chords and bass lines. He improvised, and that made every performance of Ariodante different, spontaneous, and fresh. What fun it must have been to hear him play. Now, as usual, I have a couple of wonderful recordings of Ariodante, 
for your delectation to go to the store and buy, uh, to listen to the piece, get familiar with it, so that you can really catch up on Handel's style. These recordings, I'm happy to report, are both stunning, both in sound and in terms of their performances. The first is a performance conducted by Nicholas McGeegan, one of the true experts of early Baroque practice. In the role of Ariodante, the brilliant mezzo-soprano Lorraine Hunt, and in the role of Ginevra, the wonderful soprano Juliana Gondek. The second recording is conducted by Mark Binkowski. This too is brilliant, also uses period instruments. The role of Ariodante is sung by Anna Sophie von Otter, and the role of Ginevra is sung by Lynn Dawson. You can't go wrong with either of these recordings. There's also a pretty wonderful book that's not terribly academic, not terribly technical, about Handel. It's both a biography and a survey of his music. It's simply called Handel, and it was written by Christopher Hogwood, one of the most wonderful exponents of Baroque period performance practice. He himself is a wonderful harpsichordist, keyboard player, and conductor. So with all of that information, you will be ready for a brilliant and stunning performance of Ario Dante by Handel. The operas of the Baroque era are spectacular, and we today are the beneficiaries of a 30-year movement to revive many of these works. At the center of that movement are the operas of Handel, and Ario Dante is a brilliant example of his work. See Ario Dante. I think you'll be surprised at how delightful and entertaining the music in these operas can really be. I'm Nick Ravellis. I'll see you at the opera. <laughs>